Today, when we say print, we mean so many different things. Uh, someone can talk about a photographic print, which uh, could be an original work of art in its own right, an original photograph. But they also sometimes talk about reproductions, uh, a reproduction of a painting, for example, someone might call a print. So I want to be clear about the definition. A print, a fine art print, which is what we're talking about, is an original work of art that's made by transferring ink or paint from one surface to another. Usually, we're thinking about ink on paper, but it could be other surfaces. You can print on cloth, for example. And usually we think of a print as made in multiples. Uh, however, there are a few exceptions. Uh, a monoprint or a monotype uh, is a print that's made when there's only one copy. It's done usually with a, a flat um, surface and there's nothing carved in it um, or raised up. So you only get one print from that. Um, but we're not going to talk about monotypes in this class. Uh, all the types of printmaking we'll talk about are prints that can be created in multiples. In some cases, only one survives, but originally there would have been more than one. Now, how can that be an original? Well, because of the way we think of it. We think that the final product is intended to be that print, that woodcut or that engraving. So it's original. The original drawing that the artist made is usually destroyed in the creation of the print. Think about it this way. When Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel, he did many, many, many drawings. And then he made a final drawing uh, which was transferred to the surface. And then he painted. Would you say that the painting is only a copy of the drawing? Probably not. So because these are intended in their final form to be, say, a woodcut, we consider them an original print rather than a reproductive print. Now, to be perfectly frank, now, to be frank, when printmaking began, the images that were created were really commercial art. The very earliest ones are pretty rude and crude. Um, and then, of course, they develop into what can truly be called fine art aesthetically. Um, so let's look at some of these early prints. The first type of printmaking of images that we have in the Western world are woodcuts. And the way you make a woodcut is you have a block of wood, and generally you would have an artist who would create the drawing. It would be glued to the block of wood, and then you would cut right through it. Everything that is not going to print is cut away. So the lines remain and all the spaces between are cut away. And that leaves a raised surface. You, you know, take off the original drawing and on that is the raised surface is inked and printed. And we call that a relief print uh, because the relief or the raised surface is what you put the ink on and what you print. This is an actual wood block from the 15th century. And as you can see, uh, there are certain areas that will correspond to lines in the actual print, and those are raised, and everything else between you know, is cut away. Uh, when they print it, the design would be reversed. So we're looking, for example, that the baby Jesus is on our left. Uh, if this were printed, uh, he would be on the right. Let's talk a little bit about the history of woodcut and the early printed books in Europe. Now, the first woodcut prints um, that we know about were created in China by the 7th century. 
Um, and then in Europe, the first wood block prints were printed on fabric. They were for fabric design. But then in the 15th century, you start seeing woodcuts on paper. European paper making began in the 13th century. Uh, by the 14th century, you had a larger supply of paper. By the 15th century, you're pretty much ready to go uh, with a printing industry. There's two types of woodcut images from this time. Some of the earliest woodcut images we have from the 15th century are what we call single leaf woodcuts. That means they're printed on a piece of paper, or in the case of playing cards, on cardstock, uh, very thin cardboard or thick paper uh, to create cards to play with, play games with. Or they could be religious images. Um, most of these are images of saints or the virgin and child for personal devotion. And a person who could never afford to buy a painting because pigment is so expensive, they could, you know, this would be something for the wealthy people. But an ordinary person, you know, an ordinary craftsperson could buy a woodcut. They'd be inexpensive. They can be re reproduced in multiples. So they could have an image of their favorite saint in their house. And they could say their prayers in front of it. Or just be reminded of the saint. Now they also printed early printed books. The first kind of books that were printed were called block books. And the woodcarver would have to carve out every single letter in the book backwards. If you had both a text and images, you would have to carve the image into the block. So if you had text and then an image below it or above it, uh, it would be carved in the same block. And hence they call them block books. Now you can imagine that that takes a lot of labor to carve out the entire book backwards. So some very innovative people figured out a way to make printing faster. And that was the invention of movable type. And this was right in the middle of the 15th century. Usually, Johannes Gutenberg in Mainz, Germany, is given credit for inventing movable type. You may have heard that he invented the printing press. He didn't invent the press. He invented the idea of using individual letters that could be cast from metal. And you could use, say, that E over and over and over again. You could use it in uh, a Bible. You've probably heard of the Gutenberg Bible. Or you could take that E and um, put it in you know, the story of King Arthur. I don't know if Johannes Gutenberg ever, pay, ever uh, printed that. I don't think so. But uh, you could use that E over and over and over again in different books. Now, there's another uh, person who's, uh, who's also been credited with being one of the first or first person to invent movable type. And um, his name is Koster, and he is from Harlem. So if you're in the Netherlands, uh, you know, there's a Koster invented movable type, uh, but um, in Germany and in most of Europe, they'll say Gutenberg. Now, you have this movable type. So how do you put in your pictures? Well, the woodcuts could be cut separately, and as long as they were cut type high, the same height as the type, they could simply be inserted into places. Uh, and then you could have, say, above and below letters, and they could be printed. Um, these would be what what would happen is they you know they arrange the type, um, put the would cut in, and then they would ink the entire surface with either a roller or a dauber. And then they put the piece of paper on it, 
and put it through the printing press. And you've probably seen pictures of these. These are these screw tight presses uh, where the um, press just comes down boom, on top of the type. And then you raise it up again, you ink it again, you put the paper on, and it just could be very, very fast. You'd have your apprentices running around, ink. Somebody else puts, it, puts the paper on it, and, and then someone else pulls the press down. This makes printing much faster, and it opens up books to more people. This isn't in your text, but I thought it'd be fun to see. Um, this is a 15th century block book. It's called the Biblium Pauperum, or the Bible of the Poor. Essentially, it is a picture Bible. It's not all of the words of the Bible. It's uh, essentially New Testament scene in the middle, and then on either side you have two Old Testament types or prefigurations of that scene. And as you can see, there's also some text on the page. And remember, both the images and the text would have to be carved out backwards for each page. Um, the early prints are made with very simple lines. Uh, there's very little, uh, if any, shading. This has just a little bit of shading. Uh, if you look at uh, the serpent, uh, those tempting Eve, uh, it has uh, just some parallel lines uh, going down the side. It's very simple shading. When you just have parallel lines to shade, we call that hatching. Now, this is one of those single leaf woodcuts. As you can see, we have it here in both a black and white image and a colored image. The very earliest woodcuts, when they wanted to put color on them, they were hand colored. So you would have a person who basically uses watercolor and fills in the blanks. This one's very neat. Uh, some of them are pretty messy, actually. Um, but if it has color in it, that's more expensive. This single leaf woodcut is known as the Buxheim St. Christopher. You don't have to remember Buxheim. That's where it's from, and they're just using that to distinguish this image from other pictures of St. Christopher. It is dated, and it's dated 1423, and it shows a picture of St. Christopher carrying the Christ child across the river. Now, there's a story that goes with this, uh, what we call the legend of St. Christopher, and he was supposed to be a giant or a very large man. And he made his living by carrying travelers across a river where there was no bridge. So one day he's carrying this child across the river and this child is so heavy, he can barely make it. Um, it's a miracle. Well, as it turns out, the child is the Christ child and the Christ child is bearing the sins of the world on his shoulders. So. St. Christopher is converted to Christianity. He becomes a saint. Um, he consults the friar, and you can see this little hermit uh, friar who's uh, kneeling, uh, holding up a lantern uh, on the river bank. And St. Christopher becomes the patron saint of travelers, and he's often evoked against the plague. Now, there is an inscription at the bottom, you can see this, and it translates as, whenever you look at the face of St. Christopher, you will not die a terrible death that day. There was a belief that a person who looked at an image of St. Christopher would not die that day or would make a good death. In other words, they would have time uh, to confess to a priest uh, and have their sins absolved. And there is a kind of theory about why is St. Christopher so large. Um, you sometimes will see him painted on the walls of churches as well as in prints and in paintings. And one suggestion was that he was painted 
very large because people wanted to see him so they wouldn't die that day or they wouldn't die a terrible death that day. They would have uh, time to uh, confess their sins and be absolved. And so they made the image very large for people to see. So we're not quite sure which came first. Was the idea that Christopher was a giant came first? Or was he considered to be a giant because of these large images? There's another type of print that was used in the 15th century. And that was an engraving. Now, with an engraving, instead of using wood, you use a metal plate. It's usually copper. And you use a special tool called a burin. And you cut the lines into the plate. We would say you engrave the plate. And wherever you're cutting into the plate, the metal comes up, uh, often little curly cues, and, you know, it's... Uh, separate. It's no longer part of that plate. And grooves or incised lines are left in the plate, which is the design. It takes a lot of skill, as you can imagine. Then you apply ink to the plate, making sure that the ink gets down into those grooves or incised lines. And then you wipe the surface of the plate. And this leaves the ink in the lines and usually leaves a, a tonal quality uh, to the surface of the plate. You have to use a different type of press to print an engraving. This is the kind of press that has a roller on it. Uh, and you usually have what they call a movable bed, or a, the rollers could move too, uh, which is a flat surface. And you would put the plate that has been inked on the surface and the paper on top, usually dampened rag paper. And then you put some felt, which are these blankets, on top. And then you roll the bed through these rollers that push the paper down into the grooves, picking up the ink. And then you can ink it, wipe it, and print it again. Ink it, wipe it, and print it again, and have multiple images. Now, when you have the kind of print where you have created an incised area, incised lines, um, and those are inked and printed, we call that an intaglio print. Um, some examples are engraving, and also we'll hear later about etching. One of the characteristics of engraving is that it's possible to get finer lines and more gradations of shading with an engraving than with a woodcut. And you can understand that very easily. Uh, if you're cutting into metal, the pieces of metal around it aren't going to just break off. But if you're cutting into a piece of wood and you're removing all of the wood except what prints, you have to leave a little bit of space. It has to be thicker or it will just break off. If you just had a little splinter there, you couldn't print it at all. You couldn't ink it. It would just you know, break off. So engravings generally have much finer lines, and you can do things um, like what we call cross-hatching, is uh, doing crisscrosses. And here we have two details from uh, pictures of Adam and Eve, uh, both by the same artist, the late 15th and early 16th century artist, Albrecht Dürer from Germany. And uh, if you can see the difference. You know, they're both like you know, a small detail, the same height, about an inch, uh, of the serpent. And you can see that with the engraving, uh, Dewar can put in a lot more shading, a lot more detail. Although De Dewar has done the most detailed woodcuts of, well, probably anybody.
let's look at a 15th century example of an engraving. And this is by the German painter and printmaker Martin Schungauer. He comes from Colmar, uh, which is today in France, but at that time it was part of German territories. Now, this image, this subject, is usually called the temptation of Saint Anthony, but, you know, frankly, uh, is it very tempting? Well, what you're seeing are demons tormenting Saint Anthony. Um, Saint Anthony was an ascetic saint. This means he goes off into the wilderness. Uh, he meditates. He uh, abuses himself. You know, he fasts. Um, he may beat himself. Uh, the story of him rolling in the snow and naked um, because these devils are almost always tormenting him. You know, he's, uh, uh, I guess they're trying to make him force him uh, to uh, uh, forsake Christ and uh, go over to the devil, but uh, they're not going to succeed. And in one of the stories of St. Anthony, this is St. Anthony Abbott, uh, he is carried up into the sky by these devils. And as you can see, they're beating on him and they're pulling on him and they're pinching at him and prodding him and they torment him. And then they just drop him back down to the ground. Well, he survives. And he goes on and continues uh, to be faithful to his uh, Christian faith. Now, here's some details of that. And you can see uh, the way Martin Schungauer uses this detailed naturalism uh, just by using these very fine black lines, the color of the ink, he's created the textures of scales and spines and uh, hair and uh, the membranes of wings. The way they showed devils in Northern Europe was as hybrid creatures, as monsters that were made up of uh, different parts of animals and put together as, you know, contrary to nature. It was literally monstrous. And you might also notice that the saint is calm and serene in the center. <laughs> 